Hey guys, so last chapters were intense, like serious. That was that ploy, that ruse that Josh played on poor Peak. Can you imagine having all of those emotions playing? I mean, it's a lot. It's the fact that he went from like, no, you're not climbing. And then even the climbers agreeing and being happy with it to all of a sudden, like, just kidding. Um, it was all an act. It was just the ploy to get these people to stop being so angry and so they can actually continue with their expedition with their journey up the mountain. Um, and so everything's being actually covert, right? It's all actually being secret now. Um, and I'm sure in part it's going to help uh, Sanjo because hopefully it'll get Captain Sheck off their trail looking for him, but we'll see how that turns out too. All right. Um, Again, I'm going to go ahead and read. Today we're reading um, Shortcut. As I read, I'll go ahead and explain some things that I think are important to the story. Keep in mind what each character is doing in this story. And also keep in mind Peak's point of view. I'm telling you this because it's going to help you later. All right, so keep in mind what the characters are doing, who's doing what, and keep in mind Peak's point of view. Shortcut. Gula had hauled, carried a lot more than Sanjo out of the porter camp. On the other side of the hill was a small climbing mountain of climbing gear. Coils of rope, oxygen bottles, masks, tents, food. I wondered how we were going to get it up to the upper camps. On our backs, as it turned out, because Zopa was right to work dividing the gear into five separate piles. As he sorted through the stuff, I asked Sanjo what was going on. He didn't know much more than I did. He said that Gulu had woken up him up in the middle of the night and told him that they had to leave the porter camp right away. At first, I thought Captain Sheck had discovered I was there, he said. But when we were safely out of camp, Gulu told me that Zopa was leading you and me to the summit in a separate expedition from your father's, but still on his permit. I didn't tell him how, about how I found out because I was still mad about it and a little embarrassed. Yogi and Yasha's loads were bigger than ours, but Sanjo and I still had plenty to carry. We had most of our food divided between us. Zopa laughed as we grunted under the extra weight. It will become lighter as you eat your way through the contents, he said. There is a reason why base camp and all the other camps above it are situated, located where they are. The traditional route may not be the shortest way up the mountain, but it is the safest and easiest. Not that anything is safe or easy on Everest. Zopa shortcut might have been shorter, but it was 10 times more difficult than the regular route. Our obstacle was a vast and large field of jagged ice sticking out of the ground like great white shark teeth. Sanjo and I used our walking poles so we didn't slip and impale, hurt ourselves. The Sherpa brothers didn't bother with the poles, forging, moving ahead like they were ice skating until they were two tiny dots on the horizon. horizon. I think Sopa could have easily kept up with them, but he slowed his pace, staying about a hundred yards ahead of us so he could glance back once in a while and make sure we hadn't stumbled and were bleeding out on the frozen fangs. By the time we caught up to them late that afternoon, Yogi and Yash had the camp set up, food on the stove, and were amusing themselves by throwing their axes, ice axes at the wall, at a wall of ice that appeared to brush the sky. My legs were shaking uncontrollably from fatigue. I was tired. My neck and shoulders felt like they had been worked over by a sledgehammer. My only consolation was that Sanjo looked more done in, more worked, more tired than me. He didn't even have the strength to get the, back, the pack off his back. It took us two hot mugs of tea before we could talk. By the third mug of tea, I was able to focus enough to take a good look at the wall. 
It seemed to run for miles in both directions. I figured the next morning we would follow it until we came to a pass, then make our way to the top. When I mentioned this to Zopa, he laughed and pointed directly above us. This is the past, he said. You're kidding. And he shook his head. There wasn't a single handhold or foothold anywhere where they can grasp or step in. For as far as I could see, it made the ice wall I'd been practicing on look like an indoor rock climbing wall. That means it was, it was, it looks difficult to do. After dinner, Zopa turned on the radio and we listened to the mountain chatter. Three more people had made it to the summit that morning. Eight had turned back within a few hundred feet at, of the top. A climber had broken her leg up at ABC. The virus seemed to have run its course and everyone who had stuck it out at base camp was rapidly getting better. I was about to call it a day and crawl into my tent when Josh came on the radio making small talk with one of the other expedition leaders at Camp 4. I thought Camp 4. This was very unusual. Josh was a firm believer that the radio should only be used to transmit or give out important information or communicate important information. He hated it when people used it like a cell phone. They talked about the weather, the woman with the broken leg, and scheduling summit attempts. Heard you had a falling out with your son, the leader said. There were no secrets on the mountain. Yeah, he left, Josh said, but we'll patch it up when I get down. He's a good kid. I think Captain Sheck was going to try to yank his climbing permit anyway. Now that I would have, not that I would have let him. Is Sheck still hunting for the, that other kid? Yep, still on the warpath. He detained, he stopped a porter this afternoon named Gulu. He let him go after a pretty tough grilling, but Gulu didn't know anything. That kid left here weeks ago. Not sure what he's trying to prove. I heard he was having some more soldiers trucked in. Some of them are climbers. He's going to send them up the mountain to check the higher camps. It's insane. I sent an email to the Chinese government and I have my lawyers checking into other official acts actions. The Chinese make a lot of money on these permits. Be a shame if one overzealous soldier dried up that revenue source. So one super excited soldier to end up ruining that source of money. But what are you going to do? Anyway, good luck at Camp 5. I'll check in with you tomorrow. Out. Zopa switched off the radio. The entire conversation had been set up for us, at least on Josh's end. We couldn't participate, but we could learn a great deal by listening. None of us liked the idea of, a ch of the Chinese climbers coming in. They won't be able to get past ABC, I said. They haven't had time to acclimate. Perhaps, Zopa said. How do we get by them on the way back down? Sanjo asked. Zopa shrugged. But this time, I think he really meant it. He didn't know. By the time Zopa kicked Sanjo and me out of our sleeping bags, Yogi and Yash were already 50 feet up the wall, setting ice screws so we'd have to something to hold on to. The sun was barely up. They had to have started when it was still dark. We ate quickly, packed, and strapped down our crampons and harnesses. Zopa said he was staying below to tie the packs and would climb last. A bitter wind blasted the wall ahead on, which was good because it pushed us into it. If the wind had been coming from an angle, it would have blown us right off the wall. Ice axe in each hand, dig cramp on in. Berry axe, ice splinters in your face, pull. Dig other cramp on in, berry axe, about 65 feet up, I clipped onto an ice anchor and took a breather. Yogi and Yash had already reached the top, dropped ropes, and hauled up all the gear. Zopa had just started up the wall. Sanjo was clawing his way up 20 feet below me. He seemed to be struggling, which wasn't too surprising considering he had been sick. And for the last few days, cooped up in a porter's tent. 
I waited until he looked up and gave him a wave. He returned it with a grim nod. I started again and had gotten up about three steps when I heard the yell. It took me a second to get myself anchored so I could look down. What I saw wasn't pretty. Sanjo had slipped down about 10 feet and was hanging on the edge of a protrusion, a lump by a lump of ice, by one ax. I'd seen the protrusion on the way up and knew it was too far from the wall for him to get his crampons planted in the ice. I'm coming, Zopa shouted up at him, but it would take him at least 45 minutes to reach him. Sanjo wouldn't be able to hold on for more than a few minutes. I was a lot closer. But the only thing harder and slower than climbing up an ice wall is climbing down an ice wall. I looked up, hoping to see Yogi and Yash, or Yash, but there was no sign of them. They must have already forged ahead to set up the next camp. I didn't even have time to think about what I was going to do next, which was just as well. I started scrambling sideways across the wall toward the gear rope 30 feet away. Zopa continued to shout encouragement to Sanjo. He was climbing the wall as fast as he could, but he had to know that no matter how fast he went, it wouldn't be fast enough to save his grandson. When I finally reached the rope, I gave it a tug. It seemed solid enough, but I didn't know if it would hold my weight. The brothers might not have anchored it properly because they were just hauling gear with it. I'm slipping, Sanjo said desperately. I'll be there in a minute, I shouted. Hang on, Sanjo. Sopa shouted, catching on to what I was trying to do. Don't give up. I wanted to test the rope more, but there wasn't time. I hooked onto it and gave it all my weight. It stretched a little, but it held. I swallowed my heart and crabbed my way back towards Sanjo. When I got directly above him, I quickly hooked the rope to an ice screw and I knew, sorry, I knew it was secure and repelled to him, climbed down to him. Getting the rope hooked on his harness just as his ax slipped from the ice. Got him, I shouted down to Zopa, then looked at Sanjo, you okay? He nodded, he was crying, so was I. Apparently, I had forgiven him. It took us another hour to get to the top. Zopa got there about 10 minutes after us, looking concerned and relieved. Nothing broken, he asked. Sanjo shook his head. What happened? My ax broke. Zopa nodded then looked at me. Thank you. You can thank Yogi and Yash for securing that rope, I said. The first thing I did when we got to the top was check it. The rope was tied to a carabiner attached to a three inch ice bolt that wasn't going anywhere. Sanjo and I could have played Tarzan on the rope all day long. But you didn't know that, Zopa said. Yeah, well, I said a little embarrassed. Yogi and Yash know what they're doing. Not always, Zopa said. One of the axes Sanjo was using today was the same one they were throwing at the wall yesterday afternoon. Uh-oh, I suspected they were going to hear about that when we caught up to them. And I was right. When we got to camp, Zopa took Yogi and Yash to the side and spoke to them for a good 10 minutes. He never raised his voice, but when they came back, they looked like he had whipped them. Two truckloads of Chinese soldiers got here today. Josh was talking to a different expedition leader who had just arrived at ABC, along with six military climbers. The place looks like an army encampment. Glad I'm up here, the leader said. Well, you're not off the hook. From what I hear, they're heading up the mountain tomorrow morning to check everybody's papers. If you don't have your passport, visa, and permit, they're going to boot you off the mountain. We have them. What's his problem? When the truck that Zopa and my son left on yesterday got to the second checkpoint, Zopa and my son weren't on it. The driver claimed they got in on a second truck and went another way. I hope your son's okay. No worries. Zopa wouldn't let anything happen to him. I'm sure they're well on their way to Nepal by now. I thought I'd give you a heads up about what's going on down here. Thanks, the other leader said. What about the Chinese climbers? Are, there, are they any good? They're gung-ho and well-equipped. They pulled off a high-altitude climb. 
but I'm not sure where they they were. I wouldn't be surprised if they tried for the summit while they're up here. I know I would. I hear you. What's going to get, I hear you. It's going to get crowded at the top. Zopa and the brother spread a map out and started talking in Nepalese. What's going on? Sopa says we can't stay in any of the camps until we reach Camp 5, Sanjo explained. They're picking alternative sites. I looked at the map. We were just about parallel to Camp 2, so they were right next to Camp 2, but seven or eight miles to the north. It would take us at least another day to pull up even with ABC. We could be up on the summit in less than a week. All right, so for the first time, it got real, right, for them. I mean, think about it. Sanjo literally faced death. Peak helped him out. What did his mom tell him to be selfish? Obviously, he couldn't be selfish to that situation, right? He saw his friend who was about to fall. And then he even had that realization, like, hey, that's my, like, he clearly forgave him, right? So, and I apologize, my cat is scratching on the wall. Okay, sorry. Um, so clearly, this is this is crazy. Sanjo almost died because his axe was not strong enough um, or it broke um, while he was trying to latch onto the ice. He couldn't hold he couldn't hold on to that lump of ice or that protrusion. Um, it's serious. These are fourteen year olds. Think about that. They're fourteen year olds. Some of you have siblings that age. You can imagine them climbing this dangerous mountain and literally facing death in the eye, like it got real. One thing is to hear that someone died. Another thing is to actually almost, you know, have an accident that could have ended not well. I mean, think about it during this pandemic, a lot of you might not know someone directly that um, it has impacted, but you know, you hear it in the news, but it doesn't, it doesn't, that information doesn't hit the same or doesn't, you know, you don't receive it the same until you find out you know someone that has gotten it, right, the, the virus. So think about it that way. Same thing for, for Josh, I mean, sorry, for Sun Joe and Peak. They've heard all these stories. They know it's dangerous. They get it, but they love climbing. But it isn't until they themselves face a dangerous situation that they, it finally got real. Like, Sun Joe could have died. Peak could have died. How, how did he know that that rope was going to be strong enough to hold on to them? He didn't. So that was a big giant risk that he took. And then he realized that he forgave his friend. So lots going on. This, this is the first time I think it got very real to them. And so we'll see what happens on the next one.